We would like to welcome the chaplain of Covenant University for the opening prayer. Pastor Charles, please. Praise the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, in the name that is above every other name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you for your mighty manifestations here in Covenant University. We give you glory and adoration. We worship you. We glorify your name. Father, we want to ask that you be with us in this uh, special convocation lecture. Let your counsel be done in the name of Jesus. We ask for understanding. We ask for wisdom. We ask for your presence. We ask that at the end of the day, what we'll be hearing in this lecture will be useful even in our lives in the name of Jesus. And it's going to affect our generation for the better in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we give you glory and honor. Be thou exalted, O Lord, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. And amen. Please, in our standing position, we'll take the national anthem and the Covenant University anthem. the Covenant University Anthem. Please, we may be seated. Thank you, the Covenant University Band, the Chancellor, here represented by the Education Secretary, Professor Bridget Shokun. May I establish the protocol for this 11th Convocation Lecture of Covenant University? The Chancellor and Chairman, Board of Regents, Dr. David Ojedeko, hereby represented the Vice President, Education Living Faith Church Worldwide, Pastor Mrs. Faith Oyedeko, members of the Board of Regents, 
the Executive Secretary, National Universities Commission, here represented by the Director of Quality Assurance, Dr. Noel Salu, the Vice Chancellor of Covenant University, Professor Charles Ayo, the Distinguished Convocation Lecturer, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Tai Wabuye, the Registrar of Covenant University, Pastor Olamide Olushegun, other principal officers of Covenant University here present are deans of colleges and school of postgraduate studies, distinguished members of Senate of Covenant University, members of faculty and staff, distinguished guests, kings and queens in Hebron, members of the praise, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. At this point, we'd like to recognize our principal officers that are here on the high table. Kindly allow me to also recognize just now the presence of our member of the Board of Regents, Professor Ize Obayo, and a former Vice Chancellor of Covenant University. You're welcome, ma. I'd like to recognize the Dean of the College of Science and Technology, Professor Nicholas Omoregbe. We also have the Dean of the College of Engineering, Professor Samuel John. The Dean of the College of Business and Social Sciences is Professor Francis Iyoha. The Dean of our College of Leadership Development Studies is Professor Charles Oglogo. We have the Dean of the School of Postgraduate Studies here present, Professor Shalom Chinedu. Let me recognize the Chaplain, our chaplain, Pastor Charles Ihekwaba. The Dean of Students is also seated, Dr. Omar Gweregu. Our Director of Financial Services, what we refer as the BOSA in other climes, is also here, Pastor Bayo Oladembo. Our Director of Center for Learning Resources, in some other places we call Library, is also here, Dr. Chris Nkiko. May I recognize the Registrar of Covenant University, Pastor Olamide Olushegu. The Deputy Vice Chancellor is also seated here, Professor Taiwo Abioye. And may I recognize the presence of the third substantive Vice Chancellor of Covenant University. You know who I'm talking about. Can we recognize our Vice Chancellor, Professor Charles Ayo. And our Education Secretary is here not only as our Education Secretary of the Living Faith Church worldwide, but also at this event representing the Chancellor and the Chairman of our Board of Regents, Dr. David Oyerepo. May we recognize Professor Bridget Shoko. Welcome, ma. At the appropriate time, you know what I'm, there's somebody we've not recognized at this point, but as time goes on, we'll get to know our convocation lecturer. At this time, please join me as we welcome the Vice Chancellor for his welcome remarks. The Vice Chancellor, sir. Please, can we receive the Vice Chancellor? You may please be seated. The Chancellor and Chairman Board of Regents of Covenant University, ably represented by the Education Secretary, Professor Bridget Soko, the guest lecturer of today, permit me to stand on the already established protocol. It is a pleasure for me to welcome you all to the 11th Convocation Lecture of Covenant University. This lecture is symbolic to us as an institution in a number of ways. One, the personality of the speaker, a former vice chancellor of Obafemi Awolowo University, Leife the Secretary General Association of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities, ABCNU, by extension, a Vice Chancellor of Vice Chancellors. 
to the topic of discussion, talking about benchmarking the quality and relevance of higher education for national development. You will agree with me that this is a major challenge the tertiary institutions in the developing nations are faced with. Imagine if the quality of your processes and products is substandard, then you have no business being in existence. Imagine if the processes and products are not relevant, then you are a challenge to employability and national development. Imagine again, considering our quest towards fulfilling Vision 10 2022, how well do you think we will fear if we neglect the metrics contained in the discussion of today? Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that this topic is not for a newcomer in the academia, but the esoteric. The lecturer of today, an erudite scholar by excellence, an apostle of hope, and on an, an unbiased assessor. It is my hope that we shall be schooled and educated, even as we are presented with our scorecard towards the attainment of Vision 10 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, I enjoy you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the lecture. You are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. At this point, we'd like to welcome Professor Samuel Wara to please come for the citation of our convocation lecturer. Professor Wara. the representative of our chancellor, the vice chancellor, may I stand on existing protocols as I present the citation for the convocation lecturer of our 11th convocation ceremonies. May I request Professor Fabrode to please stand. Michael. Oladimeji Fabrode, a professor of agricultural engineering and registered professional engineer, is currently the Secretary General of the Association of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities. He served a five year tenure as Vice Chancellor of Bafemi Awolowo University. Before then, he was Dean of Engineering and Head Department of Agricultural Engineering. He was President of the West African Society of Agricultural Engineering, a former Vice President Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria, Koren, a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. Professor Fabrode is also a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Engineering. He received, thank you very much, he received his BSc, MSc degrees at the University of Ife, now Obafemi Awolowo University, Ile Ife, Nigeria, and his PhD at the University of Newcastle, Upentine, United Kingdom. A thoroughbred academic, his academic accomplishments can be summarized by the fact that 
even as vice chancellor, he was leading a British DFID funded research project and supervised PhD research students. This commitment continues until now. His research interests include biomaterial properties and bioprocess engineering, technology pro policy, technology, gender, and development, and currently higher education and development. He was recently a resident scholar at the Rockefeller Foundation Study Center at Bellegio, Italy, working on his upcoming texts, Triumph of Good in Journey Through Forest of a Thousand Demons, and Higher Education for Development. Chancellor, sir, I present to you our guest lecturer, a renowned scholar, a researcher, an administrator par excellence, a triple fellow, being a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, a fellow of the Institute of Agricultural Engineers, and a fellow of the Association of Engineering as our 11th Convocation Lecturer. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The Chancellor, who is um, represented here this morning, I bring you all warm greetings from the Secretariat of the Committee of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities. Okay. Uh, I hope the high table can see. Okay, the presentation. Okay. All right, okay. Yeah. I thank the citation reader, and um, I think on my, on my behalf, he has adopted the existing protocol, so I will just stand by that. But nonetheless, we need to give honor to who honor is due. I must especially recognize the uh, chancellor who is um, ably represented here. I got the message this morning. Uh, we shall be meeting later at um, a very important occasion, which I will also uh, talk about. But I'd like to thank the education secretary, uh, Professor Shukon, who is here uh, to represent uh, the chancellor. I recognize everybody at the high table, the deputy vice chancellor who was with us in just, just over a week ago. And of course, the vice chancellor. Um, I think if anything, one needs to recognize the fact that um, uh, Covenant University has established a very, very good tradition of recognizing who needs to be recognized. I was so impressed when the vice chancellor came to the podium that um, we all rose and I have to join the chancellor to rise up as well uh, to honor uh, the vice chancellor. That is the way it should be in a university setting. And I think that should be sustained. 
Before I go on, let me uh, cross to the other side of the aisle and um, recognize the Executive Secretary of the National Universities Commission, who is represented by one of his directors, Dr. Salu, who is uh, here. When they called his name, I was looking to see where he was seated here, but this is covenant protocol, so I, I accept it like that. But I wonder if Okoje himself had come, whether we, are, if we, if we agree that he will sit in that place. Uh, knowing Professor Okoje as he is, I'm sure he would have elected that he would be on this side of the podium. Let me also recognize the Vice Chancellor of Landmark University. I'm so pleased that she's here this morning. I had predicted that she was going to be here, and I'm happy that she's, uh, she's here. Of course, she belongs to here, and she belongs to there, so <laughs> thank you very much for coming. I must also recognize the president of the former president, immediate past president of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Engineer Alon Femi, who is here. He decided that if I'm giving this lecture, he has to be here this morning. I know he has other engagements. Um, I recognize everybody on the uh, front uh, seats. I must recognize uh, Professor Awolusi, I think. Yes, because, because he had represented the Vice Chancellor on occasions at uh, the Committee of Vice Chancellors uh, when he was uh, uh, DVC. So, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Um, I, I think normally the, the, the lecture text is not circulated, so I still have the monopoly of being the only one who knows what I've written here, except the editorial team who organized the printing, and I, I think they did a very good job. Another credit to uh, Covenant University. I would like to acknowledge the great honor of being chosen to deliver the year 2016 convocation lecture of this great university. Covenant University at Otta. The noble tradition of special lectures during convocations started in earnest in this university in the year 2006 with four addresses, three lectures and an address to signal the release of the first set of eagles as you uniquely christian your graduates. The use of three lectures continued in 2007. By 2008, you had reduced the number to two, uh, ditto 2009. But by 2010, Covenant seems to have matured into one convocation lecture in addition to one keynote address at the actual release of the Eagles. This is thus the format this year, and I'm being paired with Professor Jerry Ghana, highly distinguished Professor Jerry Ghana, a former Minister of Information of the Federal Republic, serving pro chancellor. Serving Pro Chancellor of, and Chairman Governing Council of the University of Lagos as the keynote speaker, and that will be coming up tomorrow at the commencement proper. Now, when I look back at the area of eminent and distinguished personalities who had blazed the trail of the slot between 20, 2006 and now, and I have all the names listed from Professor Joy Ogu, Professor Okebu Kola, General Yakubu Gowon, Mensa Otabil from Ghana, Professor Grace Alele Williams, and Late Dickin Onosode, and so on and so forth. When you get hold of the lecture, you will know the others. Then up to Mrs. Sarah Alade of the Central Bank of Nigeria, as well as Professor Yemi Oshibajo in 2014 before he became Vice President of the Federal Republic. Then my appreciation of the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, 
the Senate and the Ceremonial Committee will be better understood. So, in consequence, I'm not taking this assignment lightly. This golden opportunity, I'm not taking it very lightly. And a convocation lecture, in my estimation, unlike the shorter commencement address, affords the speaker the opportunity to espouse the intrinsic academic characteristics of erudition, boldness in the perception, dissemination, and preservation of the truth. Academics being the custodians of the unfettered truth. And what is more, the subject of this lecture is benchmarking. So where should this be pointed? Okay. Benchmarking the quality and relevance of higher education for national development. So my reading of this charge is to address higher education generally or specifically universities to the purpose and hence the mandate. That is the relevance to human development. And I'm assisted in this definition of function by Professor Abib, Adam Abib, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of which was with Water Strand in Johannesburg, who served as our keynote speaker just over a week ago. He submitted thus, considering the subsisting serious manpower deficits and unabating development challenges of Africa vis-a-vis -vis poverty, hunger, food insecurity, general insecurity, climate change, lack of power, etc. The mandate of African universities now relates to three main areas. The first is to provide access to higher education for the teeming population of African youths who yearn for it. I put a note that this year for the UTME examination in Nigeria, for example, about 1,557,000 candidates sat for the examination, out of which about 67 percent, yeah, if they can control for me, but I can control here as well, but I have to face, yeah. about 67 percent, and that is over a million, exactly a million and 53,000, scored above 180. Because that is the general cutoff point for all universities. Some universities will use 200, but nobody will go below 180. Whereas the total carrying capacity of all the universities put together is under 700,000, exactly 695,449. So you can see that the issue of access is still a major challenge for us. So people will ask, do we need more universities? You can guess what the answer should be. The second challenge is producing skilled and creative graduates to tackle Africa development challenge. And the third one, which is also very important, is undertaking research to use science and innovation to provide solutions to tackle the issues of poverty under development and very importantly, break the African Inequality, inequality gap. So, these are the uh, very important issues that is the agenda for the university in Africa uh, today. Now, I hope this is um, uh, clear enough. The structure of this lecture, because I'm not going to be reading everything, I will, I will make it. Um, uh, more interactive, we will be looking at the decline of the Nigerian university system. I have a few uh, slides to illustrate this. And we situate this also in relation to the decline of the Nigerian economy itself. And so we try to see the basis 
of knowledge as, I mean, knowledge as the basis of human development, which is what we have not embraced very much in this country in terms of our planning. From there, we try to examine what are the concepts, what are the issues in becoming a world-class university. Because if you look at the vision of Covenant University, it is to become a world-class university producing uh, leaders for this uh, nation. And I think that is a very, very good goal. So we look at what are the parameters for world-classness of a university. And then we look at science, technology, and innovation. And then we'll be trying uh, to summarize. Yeah, OK. Move forward to the next one. First, we want to look at the Nigerian university system so that we can really understand what is the nature of the challenge that we face as a nation. The number of universities has been growing since universities started in 1948. I won't go into the argument between Unsuka and Ibadan as to whether uh, university college is, not, is the first or university is the first. We know that in the history of university system, the first that we mentioned is 1948. And Unsuka will say it is University College, not University of Ibadan. Since then, we've seen the growth. And as of today, we have 143 universities. Um, the growth is indicated in those tables. However, it is not just the growth in numbers that is of interest, but what has been the fate of the Nigerian university system. And in that, really, we have a major dilemma. We have a, a serious dilemma. No, I, I just I'll take it back to that first one. No, OK. It's OK to leave it at the graph. Challenge of national development and the decline of the Nigerian universities, I put it 1980 to 2000. We have a vicious national dilemma of one, a badly managed and plundered monocultural economy, and a self afflicted and degraded higher education system that ultimately lost its once very vibrant and global reputation. And the result that we have is a web of complicated and sustained national ineptitude and failure, disturbingly subsisting inability to apprehend our resultant underdevelopment, and to chart a new path for national prosperity. I will explain myself. And I hope the, 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 the graph that I'm displaying there can be seen from several parts of the hall. Please take it to that figure one slide. Next. No, please go forward. One more. Then next slide. Yes. This slide summarizes all that I've written in about two or three pages of the paper. Because there we can see the decline of the Nigerian university system. Three major intervals are very instructive. The first is the growth period. And by the way, this particular curve is for represents the University of Ibadan since 1948 to date. But it is typical of all the first generation Nigerian universities and to some extent some of the second generation universities. I think you can locate where Covenant University came in there in 2002. So it's Covenant University came in in the third segment of that curve. And we can see the characteristics from there. A solid foundation in the first phase in the battle. They call it the University College Ibadan era, with rising reputation. The products were well recognized 
all over the world. At this time, the quality of non-teaching staff as well as teaching staff was very high because we had, even at that time, of highly skilled registrars, bosses, deputy registrars, and so on. Not to talk of the fame of the Academy of University of Ibadan at that time. And this was also the days when the University College of Future Ibadan was also renowned worldwide, very famous. And this period, when it got to the peak, about the late 70s, was now followed by what is now referred to as the Holocaust years. And that is the period from about 1980 up to 2000. I'll try to read some of the characteristics. We gotta call it the Holocaust years or the turbulent years of university system. Highly unfavorable political and socioeconomic situation, even for the whole country. Very serious brain circulation, but it, it, was, it was more of brain drain than what we might refer to as brain circulation, because brain circulation refers to both inflow and outflow. But at the time we were talking about, it was mainly outflow. People living the system in large numbers. The strikes, and of course, the decadence of the infrastructure due to gross underfunding and so on. So you can see the great fall that happened so that by the time you are getting to the year 2000, uh, shortly before 2000, you see that we have really come very, very low. And that is a monumental collapse of the stru structures of the system. And as you can see that it is very, very difficult to recover from such a somersault. And that is the situation of the Nigerian University today. If you want concrete evidence, just take a copy of the report of the needs assessment of 2012. No, still go back to the, to the diagram, please. The, the needs assessment report of 2012-2013 is a good summary. And that was when government realized that this is not a joke, that the issue was not trivial. But even as of now, I'm sure that the full impact of the collapse has not been realized by this country. Otherwise, it should have required a special Marshall Plan to initiate recovery. Because without a good education system, everything else we are talking about development will be nothing. And we can see the evidence today. So, but the third phase, just to complete our journey through that transition, is a period of revitalization that has started in the year 2000. Um, I won't delve much into this, but this recovery actually was initiated by external forces, largely by external forces, the foundations, the funders, who felt that they must not allow things to collapse beyond that in Nigeria. The Carnegie Corporation, the Makato Foundation, the Partnership for Higher Education in Africa, who came to our rescue and then started working in some universities. University of Ibadan, Bayero University, Kano, University of Port Harcourt, Abafimawolo University, and so on, benefited, and that is what has re-energized those institutions. You will find that um, I have a full description, because I don't want to, uh, you know, bore you with, uh, there are things that you yourself know, the state of Nigerian University today, but, a full description is rendered in the lecture. Now, let me pause briefly here to record my observations concerning Covenant University. This university admitted our first set of students, and you call them the kings and the queens, and I like that name, in 2002, with the vision to be a leading world-class university committed to raising a new generation of leaders with the seven core values that have become very popular and um, inseparable from the image of this university today. 
and in difference to the new decadent features of the Nigerian university system highlighted above, you have maintained your student population at no more than about 10,000 or after 14 years. I think now it's about, about 15,000 or thereabouts. You are fully residential, at least for all the students, and that is a major, major difference. You see what off-campus has done to the Nigerian university system. You see how the fabric of society has been totally destroyed. And you see clash between students and the local community every day. Courtism and other things. There was a story just about um, two or three days ago about uh, Federal University of Technology, Uwiri, where gambling and prostitution has taken over the whole surrounding of the, of the campus. We forwarded this to all vice chancellors so that they could read and see how a Nigerian university has fallen very badly. And it can happen to any university that is not attentive to what happens around its shores. I will illustrate this with um, something later. So, you are known to be well disciplined community with zero tolerance for gross misconduct. And I'm sure those who have visited your website will see stories of steps that have been taken against students and staff. Those are the people who can come back and explain and, and illustrate what has happened to them and what they have lost. But I think it is very good that this university is maintained such high level standard. And you have a very good campus ICT network with almost all your processes and systems e compliant. And I ask, can this be related to the fact that covenants was established after the Holocaust years in the era of revitalization? Of course, you will recall that the first set of private universities, Babcock, Madonna, and the Village were established in 1999. So, there is no way they will not have listened to the mass hysteria that we've had enough of the decadence in the Nigerian university system at that time. So, the private universities have come to the rescue of the nation, just like they rescued the lower educational system in the primary and secondary schools in the preceding years of that. And I want to say that this historical evolution of private universities should not be lost for us to aptly capture the place of private universities in our national education system and our effort to revitalize the system. There are many other complementary accomplishments of private universities that I will be talking about uh, later. So we have seen how the educational system has been destroyed. Now, by the way, you will find that that period that we are talking about was mainly part of the period of the military rule, when there was disdain for knowledge. And that is why till today we have not been able to get out of this way that we look down on the academic system and the knowledge system in general. Now, let us look at the Nigerian economy briefly so that we can now see the correlation between the two. In the table that is on the screen, we are trying to look at the indices of Nigeria's prosperity by several agencies that try to rate, for instance, the Legatum Prosperity Index, Average Life Satisfaction Ranking, and so on. And you can see that Nigeria ranks very low in all the indices. So it's, it's not as if somebody doesn't like this country and it tries to score us low. Several assessments are in agreement to the fact that, and we know it ourselves. We don't even need the figures because sometimes the figures uh, you know, tend to give a wrong impression that things are good. I can remember some of the economic figures that we say that Nigeria is, um, uh, is, is growing and things are happening. And people say, not this life that we are living uh, right now. But these figures actually support so that if we want empirical evidence, we have it aplenty. Now, if you look at, uh, for example, the uh, corruption index that is shown there by Transparency International, it is not that perception that is the problem, really. 
it is the realization that what we have is self-affliction by the political elites who have tried to amass all the endowments of this country for the use of the very few in society. And the newspapers are agog with stories in the past few months. In fact, one is tempted to feel that a number of these people are really very sick. Because that level of unpatriotism for a country, for individuals who amass so much wealth when the roads are bad and people are dying, there are no hospitals and so on, it is a mark of sickness by the political elites. And I think that, if that issue has not been driven home. A lot of heads have to be examined in this country. How somebody who is supposed to be in charge of the military and co will be amassing so much wealth, 528 million monthly, and yet they had a conscience, and in fact, they are trying to defend themselves in the law courts. You know, these things are really very, very traumatic. They are very serious, and people should be crying. Yet, you have people who are trying to share them. Look at the Senate. Almost 80 of them will be going to courts to defend somebody who is totally indefensible. Somebody should have led that office to give the nation a breather and to be able to look very seriously. And what do we have a few days ago? Or well, it came to light a few days ago. It happened, I think, almost two months ago. Three members of the National Assembly going to the U.S. to mess up the country. And yet the speaker says, unless the Americans prove the case, nothing can happen to them. It's, it's really, really a matter for us uh, to, 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 to bow our heads in shame as a country. So you will see later how this affects the fortunes of the university system, because a university cannot live in isolation. You can only exist within the community. And what happens in the community affects what goes on uh, in the university. Anyway, if we go on, we will see that the major tragedy is that the manufacturing sector in Nigeria has also taken a tumble. If we have a very good um, uh, as university, I mean, yeah, sorry, um, uh, manufacturing sector, there are a lot of benefits. Some of the issues that we are battling with today will be solved. The issue of unemployment and all that. It is only where the industries are working that we can create jobs, that we can create a stable system. And that is the only way we can diversify the economy from the mono crop economy that we have now. Uh, this is well uh, treated um, in, in, the, in, in the lecture. And uh, by the time you are able to get the lecture, you will look at tables two and three to explain the relationship between whether an economy is a manufacturing economy or economy that is just buying and selling economy as we have and the indices, how these are affected. Um, I will just illustrate with uh, two examples. Uh, Nigeria, for example, our uh, total exports is only about 86 uh, uh, million in terms of value. But you look at a country like Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, and you see the numbers, and you wonder. Whereas, as somebody was saying on television this morning, we were even better than these countries in the early 60s. And today, they have used exploit of knowledge uh, to gain advantage uh, over us. So, this again, I have Christian, the rise and fall of industrial manufacturing in Nigeria. And that should take us to the second figure. Um, the rise and fall of Nigeria's industrial manufacturing, and uh, you can also see how manufacturing output grew just after we became independent, and we had the national economic plans, uh, one, two, and we're establishing all the industries at that time. Um, the, even I mean, the uh, assembly plants, Volkswagen, Pojo, Leyland Trucks, and Co. We had the fertilizer plants. We had the steel plants. I mean, we started. We knew that we needed steel to be able to develop this economy. We established the steel plants. 
a larger steel, Ishugo, uh, steel plant and also the machine tools, they were all established. We started a job with our program because the, the indications are these are the basis for an economy that is bound to grow. But today, all these have collapsed. So you can also see the tragedy in that curve, the collapse of the Nigerian manufacturing system. In the years, just coinciding exactly with what has happened in the university system. And what I've tried to do is to use available data to fit into this, and you find that you get almost the same coverture as the failure of the university system. So a country's economy can only mimic the knowledge system that it has. Any country that has its deal for knowledge and does not care about how the products of the universities will flow into the economy and develop the economy cannot uh, make it. And so that is the point that that curve uh, is illustrating. So the similarity of the curves in figures one and two should be obvious. We have produced them to indicate the fluctuating figures of the Nigerian economy and the collapse of the university system, to emphasize the symbiotic relationship between knowledge and development and the vicious circle of our planlessness and misplaced emphasis. The way forward for Nigeria, as copious examples from South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, India, and China, not mentioning the industrialized economies of Europe, Canada, and the United States have shown, is a well-shattered knowledge economy. The hallmark of such an economy are what we shall be considering subsequently. So I'm trying to pay so that I just only lay the ideas for people to get the full gist. And this is a lecture that people have to read and read over again to be able to um, really capture the essence of what we are saying. So we now go to the evolving mandates and mission for the Nigerian university system. Next slide. No, back. 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 OK. We have had it so rough. And things are almost still like that. Nigerian universities must re-strategize to face the future. Hence, the need for strategic rethinking of how we must proceed. One thing that is clear is that we need a very strong research base in the entire system, and particularly in the use in the development and appropriation of science and technology. I quickly insert just a glimmer of hope, um, but I, I think I will come back to that theme uh, later in talking about the African Centers of Excellence. So in addition to a strong commitment for research, we need to intensify and leverage on ICT for total governance. I said Covenant is already uh, doing well in this, but I'm sure um, there are still a number of things that can be done. And I just refer to something that I can say is the legacy that as VC of OAU, what one of the things I left behind is a strong ICT university uh, on the basis of what a US-based Nigerian diaspora has been able to do in the system. I also noticed that River State University of Science and Technology also has a good ICT system. Uh, the conference that we had in just, just last week, that of last year, was at River State University. But I noticed that buttons have changed and it appears things are not as I have said about that university. And that is part of the dilemma of our governing system in this country. And I'll be indicating later the, 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 the quality of leadership, how it is very, very critical uh, to the Nigerian university system. Um, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to unduly beat the Trump of Covenant University, 
But I would like to seize this opportunity, and I'm happy that um, after this lecture, we are going to commission uh, a major initiative of commitment to research by this university. But having looked through the system, and I see that in many areas, Covenant is uh, giving the lead, and I say the next challenge is to really home in on research. And I'm so happy that a center for research and innovation and development is being commissioned. I think that is the next mandate of this university. And when I talk about the African Centers of Excellence, I will come back to this theme. But I note also that in the last uh, UTM examination, Covenant as a private university is the university of first choice in terms of the number, even though the number is low compared to the non-tuition public universities. But nonetheless, Covenant is the university of first choice among the privates. And as your publications have indicated over and over, and I think that is very good because you must beat your own drum for people to be able to appreciate what you have done. The performance of um, Covenant grad, uh, graduates in the Presidential Special Scholarship Scheme has been very, very, imp I mean, impressive. Um, Dr. Saliu from NUC can talk more about that. How very proud we are that um, this university is giving other universities a run for their money, and they are really uh, showcasing what should be done. So I will quickly move on in trying to look at the challenge for Nigerian system. We want to look at it in terms of the global challenge for humanity and universities. And universities have a very big role in the, uh, in the global challenge. Next slide. OK, this, when I was talking about the challenge for Nigerian system, I was trying to refer to the vision 2020 that was done before that seems abandoned somewhere. So if we talk of good plans, we have the good plans. To some extent, it can be, it can be modified. But to simply just forget about it because you don't know what is inside and you think that it's a useless document, it's really very, very disturbing. I think that is the best document that Nigeria can uh, you know, present as of today. And one of the goals there is to grow the science and technology sector, produce at least 2,000 PhDs. But this is very important. It's very fundamental that we must have those with knowledge system to be able to forecast and make uh, predictions about the future. You see, national planning is not just about planning for today. It's not just about planning how to be able to pay worker salaries. That's a backward planning system. If you have to be struggling to be able to pay worker salaries, that is no planning at all. Planning and taste looking to the future. With what we have now, what are we going to have in the next five, in the next 10 years? Governance should not be by magic. I mean, people plan and know what is going to happen. So you don't just wake up and find that states can no longer pay their workers. It is ridiculous. And it's an indictment on all those that we have in political offices today. But we don't seem to know how to really make demands of our leaders. And we just allow them to go on and on, and they come on and pontificate and start making explanations. These are people that should not be walking the streets at all because they have failed completely. How can you have 27 states not being able to pay worker salaries? It's a national disgrace. What do you want them to be doing? They will be stealing, their, because they have to send their children to school. They have to feed. Somebody works at the end of the month, nothing to pay. What do you want him to be doing? So it's evidence of very bad national planning. So the global society have come together to enact the Sustainable Development Goals, which follows from the MDGs. The MDGs were not well implemented in most of the developing countries in Africa here in particular. And so the world came together in 2015, 2016, and they've come with this charter of development goals. So I just make a brief mention of, of those um, issues that there are now 17 sustainable development goals, and the focus is to eradicate poverty. And extreme poverty is to be eradicated by 2030. So it's a challenge for African countries, and African countries have also decomposed what in this relates to them. But African countries are very good at um, 
you know, coming together and just making all these uh, projections without actually uh, implementing them properly. So that is what we have in the next slide. Please, next slide, please. The next one, too. Okay. Now, in order to be able to tackle the uh, SDGs, we need universities that are highly committed to research. This is not to say that teaching is not very important. If you, when we go forward, you will see that one of the outputs of universities is high quality graduates, and that comes from the sort of teaching. But I want to say that you cannot be a good teacher if you are not a good researcher. It's absolutely impossible. Otherwise, you'll be teaching what is not current. You'll be teaching what the students of today cannot be at par with you. You will not be on the same page with you because things are changing in a very dynamic way. Students have access to all the information they need now just on their palm tops. They don't even need to use laptops. And so the academics of today also must be dynamic. And this is true research to know what is going on today. And as you are teaching students, you are telling them what just happened in the field. I mean, or in your research yesterday, a week ago and not what happened a thousand years ago. So I believe that, and the, the World Bank um, says, it's not in error, that world-class universities are research universities. So even for non-research universities, they must engage in some research to keep the currency of their teaching and everything. So the next slide. So to that extent, we now want to look at what are the hallmarks of um, world-class universities. Uh, the rest of the text about the sustainable development goals are in the text. They are listed in box one, which is to be found on page 27. But let me move quickly to the concept of world-class institutions. There are so many all marks. A lot has been written on the attributes of world-class universities. World-class universities are simply what others we call elite universities or flagship universities or universities that have brought the same that they are recognized all over the world. And I'm sure that if, if I were to ask the audience now to name some universities, they've been naming the likes of Harvard, MIT, and they also maybe mentioned Cambridge, Oxford. These are universities that have brought themselves that readily everybody you know, now knows them. And so we cannot run away from the fact that universities are ranked or universities are classified. It has become something that is inevitable. Even if you say you don't like it, those doing it will continue to do it. And the ranking will continue to haunt universities. The good ones, we point to it and say, as Covenant has done in, in our publications, we are this in Africa, we are this in Nigeria. And those that don't feature, they keep quiet and they will not want to talk about it. But they are haunted by the specter of the fact that they are lowly ranked. And we as students are very perceptive. It is one of the things that people look for. You want to pick universities that in the top leagues, you don't want to be seen to be going to some um, backyard universities, as they say, because the international content of university is one of the hallmarks. Whether you have diversified a student population, diversified staff population, you will see in that curve of Nigerian universities that I, that I showed, at that peak in those universities, Ibadan, Ife, Unilag, you have a very rich flavor of the academia and students. Students were coming from all over Africa and other parts of the world to those universities at that time, lecturers from all over the world. But today, we have all become, I mean, local universities more or less because of that serious collapse. So the, 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 the cough, I mean, the graph that we have there 
has been something that tries to summarize the concept of world-class universities. You have three big circles. The first one talks of a concentration of talents. That's in terms of the quality of staff that you have and the quality of students that you have. And that is very important. If you have all the infrastructures and you don't have the good staff to do the research, you can know that everything will come to naught. So the quality of talents is there. The second one is abundant resources. And that is in terms of the level of funding that you have, the level of your infrastructure. I mean, do you have very good laboratories if you want to do science? And you cannot do any experiment in your laboratories. What sort of university will that be? And so on and so forth. So it is also very important. And that is why funding is very important. Money is not everything, but you cannot run away from the fact that governments have to provide a lot of funding for universities. And when I say governments, that funding must be for all universities, not only just the public universities. And I think somewhere in the lecture, it is mentioned. So we have this dichotomy. I think I will, I will wait until I get to the issue of AC uh, to, to home that point. The third cycle relates to favorable governance. Universities must have very, very favorable governance system. That's why leadership is very important. And when we say leadership in the university setting, we are not talking just of the vice chancellor. And we are not talking just of the governing council or the board of regents of the university. We are talking of the totality of everybody that is here. The deans, the heads of departments, the heads of units, and everybody. A university will only go where everybody is making contribution to its development, where everybody feels that this is our university, and so I must bring in innovation. If you allow only the university to be thinking of how the university will grow, nothing will happen, because he has too many things clouding his head. But every faculty must be coming forward with their progress plan and how they want to make that university to, I mean, make that particular faculty to be the best not just within the university, but within Nigerian universities and, and the world. And so when you aggregate all that, it becomes a plan for the entire university, and you synergize and you work together. So favorable governance is very important. Now, this is where university autonomy also comes in. Universities perform better when they are given their autonomy to be able to do what they have to do. When you teleguide all that universities do, you are going to have challenges. So um, the literature is, um, is well discussed there. Um, and we say favorable governance that encourages strategic vision, innovation, flexibility, and not encumbered by bureaucracy in decision making and resource management. Now, this was a model put forward by somebody who used to work at the World Bank, Salme. It was in 2009. There have been studies after this to test this model in several other universities. Himself and his colleague, they worked on 11 other universities all over the world, I think in 11 countries, including the University of Ibadan. And they came with results that have identified factors that we tend to accelerate um, this working towards becoming a university of excellence. Now, there, are, there have been a lot of criticisms of this ranking by those who are not favored and by people who are genuinely concerned that ranking seems to be based only on the issue of quality and that where then is relevance? relevance to the national goal. You know, in your motto, one of the things is to produce leaders that are very I mean, appropriate to this environment. So the issue of relevance is also very important. And if you look at the topic of the lecture, benchmarking, quality, and relevance. And I think um, that topic, I could not vary it because it was very, very appropriate. And I left that topic as given to me. The issue is not only just of quality, but of relevance to your local environment. And this is where we ourselves now admit that 
Nigerian universities still have a long way to go. Because the problems of poverty that we have around us is still there. Compounded now, problem of IDPs and so on. How are our universities responding to all these issues? They are also part of the global challenges that have been mentioned earlier. So, in order to answer this call, there are other measures, there are other matrices of assessing universities. And that is what is in the next slide that was displayed. That which relates to technology transfer, that is the use of technology for development. That is, when you do research, it's not just research for research sake. It's not just research to write papers that don't have impact. In other climes, I will explain to academics that when you write a publication, and maybe 10, 20 years later, nobody has started that publication. That publication is totally useless to humanity. That means nobody has made use of you know, what you have produced. So your work must make meaning to others to appreciate and to use in the course of development. And that is where citation analysis is very important. And so, um, when we publish, we must publish the purpose of the fact that that research must have impact. And so, that classification now talks about knowledge creation and knowledge dissemination. Knowledge infrastructure, centers of innovative activities. How do universities fulfill this purpose? How do you engage with the civic society with your results? Remember, the tripartite functions, if you simplify, is teaching, research, and service. That service is about the most important component because it's what ties your teaching and your research to humanity. And that is where we must pay attention. So another classification has tried to incorporate that, and it's explained there, technology transfer classification of world-class uh, universities. And in uh, one of the topics I said, relevance of fidelity to mission. That is, the essence of strategic planning is for you to look at your vision and see whether your output is practically contributing to that vision. Any university that cannot link its outputs to its vision, then it's not delivering the goods. So I think that has sort of silenced those who criticize ranking. That now is not only on the basis of quality, it's only on, also on the basis of relevance. So that even if somebody is doing research, because there are people who do research, proprietary research, that they work with some companies, and so they may not be allowed to publish for maybe a period of moratorium, five, ten years, and so on. And so you may not be able to find their work in citations. But citations have even gone beyond only published material. I mean, John has a little bit. Other published things are now uh, utilized in the new matrices of, of ranking. But all the same, even if you are not publishing just for publishing's sake, the impact of your research on humanity can also be measured as one of the instances of uh, classification. So when you have done all this, and Salmi and Co have examined working on these other universities, and they find that there are some factors that can accelerate um, this uh, endeavor. That is extensive use of diaspora, and I think private universities are doing a lot of that. Concentrating on niche areas, identify some niche areas and focus on them and also some new introductions in terms of uh, pedagogy and uh, curriculum. And I think Covenant has also done a lot of this. The last aspect there is benchmarking. And that actually is the, uh, is the topic of this, of this lecture. But before I uh, do more work on benchmarking, I want to show the slide on the education ecosystem. Yes. What this curve is saying is that a university can never be viewed in isolation. A university exists within a nation. And so, to that extent, you want to look at several parameters that will impinge on the university, the macro environment, the overall political and economic situation of the country, for example, 
together with the issue of the rule of law, enforcement, and so on and so forth, they do affect how universities perform. And, and that is why you cannot divorce the university system from the nation itself. Countries that have better understanding of the needs of universities, the universities will thrive better in those universities, unlike universities where everything is regimented and under control. So, if you have a national assembly that is peopled by those who don't know what they are doing, there is no way they can legislate properly for <laughs> the educational system of the country. If all they are concerned with is um, what they are going to uh, ex exert from the system, not what they are going to contribute to the system. Legislators go in day and night, and all they are thinking about is how to circumvent the laws, how to break the laws and enrich themselves. There can be no progress in such a country, and all they want to do is just circumventing the system. I mean, in the fight against corruption, how can somebody be saying that, um, I mean, we know that that should not be the only thing for governance. Governance should be concerned about what is affecting the masses. But everybody, people have analyzed that corruption is the major bane of this economy. And so fighting it should be a battle that everybody should cooperate. So if somebody is trying to uh, use the legal system, I mean, to so sustain corruption, that can never be in the interest of a country that wants to progress. So in addition to that, you have leadership, I mean, governance regulatory framework, quality assurance framework. And in our conference in JOS, we have said every university must have quality assurance as a major focus. Because it is better to have internal mechanism for quality assurance than waiting for NUC to come and run after you. I mean, as you demonstrate some of your qualities now, that should be the way. You should say, come and see what we are doing. And don't wait for somebody to come and say, are you doing this right or are you not doing this right? So universities must institutionalize and internalize quality assurance system. And that is the way forward for universities to have quality assurance. Financial resources and all the other things are there in that curve. In the text, it's on page 40. It's, it's, it's on display. So I quickly just talk about benchmarking um, because it is very important. There have been criticism of rankings, and somebody said benchmarking should be preferred to ranking. Uh, but eventually, before you can do, do benchmarking, there must be some ranking that you want to do. Because in benchmarking, you must try to compare yourself with some other institutions, maybe two or three other universities. And how do you choose those universities? You want to choose somebody that is well above you, somebody that is about your level in terms of all the attributes that you can think of now. And you also take somebody that is, uh, you know is not doing too well, so that you can have some happiness that at least you are beating some people. And so when you have those three perspectives, you have a balanced view. You can aspire to beat the leader. You aspire to beat somebody at par with you. And you want to see if you can even lend every hand to somebody who is well below you. And so benchmarking has come to be used as one of the steps of moving towards a quality university system. Um, the sequencing, as uh, Professor Okebukola has done a lot of work on this, and he has looked at the sequencing. After benchmarking, you do a gap analysis, and you take some steps. It has to be ordered. And so that is there, the details are there. And the next slide shows what he did, trying to compare Nigerian universities with uh, US world-class universities, UK world-class universities, so that you can see the gap. And you can, from that graph, you can see some of the gaps there, that they are really massive. And um, even in our uh, conference in JOS, he also uh, came up with some of these uh, analysis. I want to uh, just refer to one of them, that when we talk about abundant resources, for example, working with a panel of UNESCO experts, they found out that a university needs an annual income of about $751,000 per academic staff in order to have the sort of resources that will make the university develop in a very good way. $750,000 per academic staff. 
So we did a small analysis. ABU has the largest number of staff in the Nigerian system, uh, about 19, 1,900 or so. When you multiply ABU, we need about 440 billion naira per annum. And what ABU gets is just in the range of about three to <laughs> eight billion for that. So you can see that it's a tall order. So this has led me to say that, look, for us in Africa, no single university can compete with the global universities if you want to be serious. And so we need to work together and uh, try to uh, move forward uh, together. So the, the benchmarking is there. And um, as I noted on page 44, the time has come for African universities to create a global academy of commons and try to work together. It is only through such a well-crafted alliance that we can compete with the best of the global universities. And the second point is that to bridge the knowledge gap and close the development gap divide, African governments, especially in Nigeria, must increase the level of investment in funding higher education. I mean, the efforts to inject some funds is commendable, but it's still a far cry from what we need if we know the level of our challenge and if we believe that it is the university or education system that is going to bail this country out. Uh, states believe that federal government can bail them out and they, are, they go cap in hand and collect the bailouts. If only they know that it's only the universities that can bail them out, then they will know the, the best thing to do. I refer quickly to what we have done at the Committee of Vice Chancellors working with NUC to try and do a benchmarking of the Nigerian research base and the, the, the products are there. We have looked at four major strategic areas research output, growth and impact assessment, brain circulation reports, which shows both inflow and outflow of uh, uh, experts from Nigeria. And we have a list of the experts all over the world uh, where they are, their specialization. Uh, it will interest you to know that we have more Nigerian nurses in Canada today than in Nigeria. More nurses in Canada than practicing in Nigeria today. So if they are sought out, it means they are very good. That's why they are sought out in Canada, and they are there. They are working, and they are developing that economy. Those that we have spent so much of our money to trade, they've gone to use that knowledge, and yet the hospital system here is collapsing. Research collaboration reports is also there. You see, research collaboration is very important because you get better leverage for your work when you collaborate with your colleagues within Nigeria and outside Nigeria. Academic corporate collaboration, that collaboration with industry and other transfer. So those reports are available at the CBC website. What I've just done is just to illustrate with only one of them. The next slide. Next slide, which shows the output of research in terms of publications over the last, um, from 2004 to 2013. And in the spirit of benchmarking, we have tried to compare with some other countries, seven other countries. In Africa, we use Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania, because there's a project in which we, we are looking at other comparisons. So we try to look at them. And in, in, um, we look at Egypt and South Africa being the leaders in Africa. And outside, we try to look at Malaysia, that was um, not at par with Nigeria some years ago, but now it's there, and South Korea. And the result is what, is what you have there. You can see that South Korea is way ahead of the pack in terms of publication and so on and so forth. Um, the growth of Nigeria there will seem a bit impressive. The rate is about uh, almost 12, 11.99%, the growth rate. Uh, but you have to assess the full report, four volumes of reports, to understand what I'm saying. Um, that picture there is a bit deceptive because in terms of output, we have it. But when you look at, when you denominate in terms of weighted index of the publication, that is, how are they cited and how are they being used by other researchers? The little work done by Uganda and Tanzania has helped humanity more than what we have done in Nigeria. Uh, so if you assess that document, you'll be able to see that. Um, so it makes a lot of interesting reading. 
uh, to see what this report uh, has done for us. And with that, we now see what can we do for the collective of the Nigerian system. And we said two things must be done. Next slide. Um, there should be one before that. Back one step. Okay, go forward. That's the network system, the Nigerian Education Research Network, we must develop it. It's been elusive. When we went on a trip in China in 2010, small, small boys in China were telling us how they are managing. It is one university working with two others that developed the system for the whole of China. Just one of their universities, working with two other universities. And they are talking of 100 gigs of their network. And we said, let us come back to Nigeria and do one that is just 2.5. We have been on it since then, and it's been going on and up. It's been very difficult to convince the Federal Minister of Education that this is something that Nigeria must just invest in immediately and get all the universities connected. We got to the Jonathan government, he agreed, and gave the directive, but the directive was not obeyed. I mean, so when Jonathan says he was not in charge, he was correct. He gave the directive and people just, they just threw it aside. And so today, we are asking universities to make the contribution themselves so that we can get, if the government is not going to do it for us, let the universities work together because we get it cheaper. The bandwidth cost can then come down crashing considerably. So instead of sending about 100 million on bandwidth, you spend just about 20 million. And so it makes sense and we are trying to do that. In addition to that, we said e-resources should be available for all the Nigerian universities, all the journals that we need, all the books and so on that we need. So we are also doing this in consortia with the various publishing houses. And one of them, we said, look, part of the problem is that Nigerian journals are not visible. You publish in local journals, they are not cited because they have not met the quality of the publication. So we said, come and work with us. Those journals that Ted Fund are supporting, Let's begin to take them and develop them. So we chose the first six, and they were supported, they were mounted. Nigerian Medical Journal, Journal of Mathematics, and they were being hosted, and they were already seeing the result, the advantages. But because we have not been able to pay, that thing has been discontinued now, and those people are crying every day, that how can we lose something that is so much of good value? So that is the country you are, and that is not what the National Assembly is thinking about. That is not what Education Ministry is uh, concerned about. So these are the major problems. But in spite of all this, we must not lose hope. We must continue to do what we can do. And the, the next slide is, I mean, that, that's the workshop that the editors of those journals had when they came and them. Um, all of them were so enthusiastic. Even we brought others who are not getting support, and everybody now was clamoring to get. We said, okay, next year we add more. But those six that started, they have dropped off. So how can we add more and get more? That was what Egypt did. In spite of the problems in Egypt, their science focus remained. And they have remained because they have gone through these steps and they are developing their science because they know that that is the basis by which they can control their economy. So I, I think um, I still have about five or 10 minutes or so. The next section is also talk about science, technology, and innovation. And uh, I, I will leave the audience to uh, read this through in the paper. Uh, it's, it's basically that we need research alliances to be able to, yeah, OK. I estimated I need just about five minutes more. And in building research alliances and in trying to um, help ourselves, I have referred in several parts of this text to the African Centers of Excellence, which competition took place late um, 2014. And by last year, we had some results. For West and Central Africa, 19 universities were chosen, 19 institutions were chosen, and Nigeria had 10 of them. They are listed in um, 
the table it should be in, in one of the next slides. Um, two private universities are amongst them. The African University of Science and Tech in Abuja in materials, you know, setting up the Pan, Pan African Material Institute. And of course, the Redeemers University at the in the area of uh, genome of infectious diseases. And I want to say that these two are the best performers in all the 10 that we have now. But it is commendable that Nigeria could muster 10 out of 19. And when we had a workshop and the minister was there and I said, Nigeria should at least take this first set of universities and develop them to the, and make sure that they become true centers of excellence. We, what Redeemers has done in the area of Ebola and infectious diseases is commendable. And so it's a very good example. And today they are publishing in the top journals. They have about four articles now in Nature. Nature, the impact of an article there is about 45. So even if 10 people publish and they divide it equally, each of them will have impact of 4.5 each. That is a single article in Nature. And they are publishing in such journals now. So it is possible. And this gives us hope that we must believe in ourselves. After all, the Nigerians who are excelling, they trend here. They are products of our universities. So we should not allow the elements to put us down completely and turn all of us to people who don't know how to do things. There are people who can do things in this country. And a lot of them are outside. So we need to collaborate with them in the diaspora and bring them back. And when we talk of collaboration, we talk of the universities and the industry. And government must facilitate this collaboration, industrial collaboration. In those uh, assessments that I said we did about Nigeria, the average impact of Nigerian publication is 0 0.5, I mean 0 0.45, which is very low. The world average will be one. But articles published by scientists at the University of Port with Shell and Co. had impact of 4.19. So you can see what industrial and external collaboration can do to publication uh, intensity. So unless we work more with industry, we will not be able to produce the sort of knowledge that will impact on society. Uh, Federal University of Agriculture, Abekuta, has done a lot of work, and at least two examples are given here um, of how they've worked with industry to collaborate. And that's why, for me, it's surprising that they want to move away from being University of Agriculture to General Purpose University. So we established universities of technology, universities of agriculture. They are all doing law and everything now and distorting their mission. So we hope to have a summit very soon to look at all these issues and ensure that Nigerian uh, progress is better guided. So um, I give an example of what has happened in Korea. And that's that slide that uh, was there. Um, Korea, in, <laughs> about 50 years ago, it was just coming from I mean, a war-torn country that nobody would want to touch. And they have no resources, no oil, no minerals, and nothing. But today, they boast of knowledge. In ICT and everything, they have used that knowledge. And they have become a world power without any resources. So. We give example of what did they do over the years. These are little things. Some of them we did, but we didn't do properly. And so the example is there, what Korea has been able to do to come to where they are today. So I just um, summarize that we need to embrace industrial production and manufacturing. That is the way forward for the Nigerian economy. That's the only way we can diversify. And when people, when we say this and people are looking, I wonder, this has been done before in Western region of Nigeria. When Chief of Abimawilowa established the industrial complexes, the government of the states and so on, that was laying the foundation because it knows that the product from the free education system, we need that to be able to have proper knowledge. You have students today, they go for industrial training, they just go and work in offices and so on. There is no industrial training anymore. But in those days, with the industry there, you, the vicious circle, you go to the industry, you are well trained, you go back and work in the industry, and so 
the network continues. So unless we reestablish the industrial complexes and get them working, we will not be on the roads to recovery of this economy. And the Molo economy will continue. People have talked about agriculture. That is the way that we have to go. Research, knowledge, innovation systems, partnerships are also very important, as I've shown. And we need to build an effective alliance, all of us working together uh, to be able to develop this economy. And I end on the note that, as I've said earlier, it is my joy that after this lecture, what we are doing next is to ensure that covenants situates more in the area of research by establishing that institute, that center for research, uh, innovation, and, and development. Uh, for me, that is the greatest news that is coming out of um, uh, Covenant University today, and I want to commend you, and I wish uh, this university uh, uh, more success in providing leadership for the Nigerian private uh, university uh, system. So thank you very much. Uh, I believe that Nigeria has a, a promising future. The youth are the strength of this country. But that is, if we are able to provide something for their appetite that is, that is yearning to deliver. If we don't, it will be replaced by antisocial elements. And it will be destructive for this economy. The youth board is a double-edged sword. If we capitalize on it, it will propel this country forward. If we don't, if we sink this country more because we are going to have superior problems, look at the Avengers. There are several names that are coming, all sort of rascals coming up and uh, saying they are fighting for something. It is because of idleness. It is because we are managing poverty. If we are managing wealth, they will all be, yes, because somehow they were introduced to slush fund and they were spending dollars in the creeks and so on. Now that is drying and uh, it's a problem. So the youth, they must be given the proper skills so that they can help us to develop this country. The explosion in the ICT industry over the year, 2001 to now, from 500,000 subscribers to over 100 million and over 90 million having access to the internet, that is the push of this country. This is my presentation. If it's uh, this youth now, you see the way they will have done it. It will be flying up and down, and then we'll be enjoying it. That is their power, and we must capitalize on it, rather than allow them to continue uh, to be nuisance to this country. I thank you very much for your attention. Please, can we sustain that applause for the wonderful lecture that we've had? Thank you, Prof. Please, we may be seated. Having listened to this wonderful lecture, the 11th Convocation Lecture, it is my privilege at this point to welcome the representative of our Chancellor and Chairman of the Board of Regents, Dr. David Oyedeko, a member of the Board of Regents here present, and our Education Secretary, Professor Bridget Shokonto, please come for the Chancellor's remarks. Please can we receive the Chancellor, Covenant University. Praise God. Um, I want to stand on the existing protocol, but I want to recognize the Vice Chancellor and, of course, our erudite uh, scholar, the lecturer of today, a former Vice Chancellor and currently the Secretary General. Uh, that was a lot of work 
Thank you so much. I'm sure we cannot, we don't have the time to completely debrief what he has packaged in that uh, convocation lecture, but I believe that the management will run with it, will brainstorm on it and uh, break it, distill it down to actionable points and, you know, useful tips for Covenant University. It's, the lecture is very apt, considering that we want to become one of 10 in 10 in six years. We're getting closer to the uh, timeline, and this has opened us up as to what we should be doing. Um, I was able to pick, before I go into the paper, let me uh, bring the greetings of the Chancellor. His spirit is here. Um, he is also preparing for tomorrow and has asked me to stand in for him. Um, in Professor Faberis, uh, Faberides lecture, uh, the following points came up. One, I believe that Covenant University is already on course in number of research clusters and we, we are not there yet. We'll continue to increase the number of clusters that we have and we'll continue to see that when we have discoveries, we get them patented. Uh, recently, I, I saw in the correspondence of the VC three new patents. Congratulations. And uh, this is a, a right platform to also appreciate the Vice Chancellor and his team on the effort they are making towards, you know, building up the research base of the university. Well done. I believe for us to become one of 10 in 10, we need to be more visible than we're doing. We need to market what we have. And one way by which the lecturer uh, highlighted is to engage in these globally competitive contests. Uh, just yesterday or day before, some of our graduate students emerged in the last 10 of a Watson IBM competition and the only African university. Congratulations. So we need to scale up our engagement in such contests so that we can be cited and be seen as globally relevant. Of course, we also need to make our university more sensitive to attracting foreign students and faculty. And our lecturer clearly brought this out in his lecture. We must provide incentives that can attract them. We have a ready platform in the church our church is worldwide. We have churches in almost all the continents of the world. In Africa, we have in South Africa, we have in Kenya, we have in Ghana, we have in Liberia, we have in Zambia, Lusaka. In Europe, we have in the UK, and in North America, we have in Canada, we have in the U.S., a number of states in the U.S. So if we leverage on the platform of the church, we can attract these um, faculty and students that will transform the status of our university. I know that this lecture is not really on CU. It's on national development benchmarking, but I'm a bit selfish by narrowing down to what we can take from the lecture and how that can leap us up. I also took from his paper his proposition that 
maybe these global indicators, maybe we need to take a second look at them. How much of civic engagement do we derive from these indicators? And he suggested that maybe it's time to have an African university, higher education commons. I think that's a good one, and I'm sure the management will hold it and run with it. But we will still have to go back to the African Union, AAU, and your organization to help us catalyst that. It is very important as a continent to have a platform whereby we can collaborate and network. And maybe that one can, you know, leap us up to the world, you know, media, world window to say, look, something is happening in Africa. Let's take a second look. Then, lastly, he talked on this partnership, university-industry partnership, the type that is do done in the U.S. Uh, the one that comes to my mind is the Silicon Valley in the state of California. No wonder California is one of the richest states in the states, if not the richest. He also talked about the triple helix in South Korea. And I'm saying that we can do that here in Covenant University. We have, yes, we know that the environment right now is not so attractive for the industries because of the economic glut. But we still have a number of industries around here, Agbara or Taaxis, that we can partner with we need to do a needs assessment. We need to reach out to them. What exactly are their needs? And then we capitalize on that. I believe that when we look around our catchment area to satisfy or you know, meet some of those needs, that itself can form a basis for us to take it to the next level. Um, like I said, we don't have enough time to bring out all the issues, but I will take this message back to the Chancellor. I'm sure there will be an opportunity for you to meet him before this convocation ceremony is over. But on the behalf of the Chancellor and the management faculty senate uh, of Covenant University, I want to appreciate you again. That has really given us food for thought. And I'm sure we would not just, it will not end here. We will drive it, we will run with it, and I'm sure that some actionable points will derive from it. Thank you very much. Please can we applaud the Chancellor's representative. Thank you, ma'am. Please, you may be seated. Steadily, we are getting to the end of this session, but we'd like to make some recognitions. We'd like to recognize some persons that have been part of this lecture. May not be all of us. May I recognize very respectfully the representative of the Executive Secretary of the National Universities Commission here present, who is also the director of quality assurance of NUC, Dr. Noel Salu. Thank, Thank you, sir. We had earlier also noticed and mentioned that the immediate past vice chancellor of Covenant University, who is also now the vice chancellor of Landmark University, and indeed a member of our board of regents is also here, Professor Isaac O'Brien. Yes. Yes. Welcome, ma'am. We have the Vice Chancellor of Delta State University here in our midst. May I recognize Professor V.F. Berektomode, the Vice Chancellor, Delta State University. Welcome, sir. 
The representative of the Vice Chancellor, Namdia Zikiwe University, is also here, Professor I.A. Equialo. Professor Equialo, you are welcome, sir. We have here present the immediate past president of NSE, that is the Nigerian Society of Engineers, they're present in our midst, and sir, later you are going to make, we are welcome, Engineer Demola or Laura Femi, you're welcome, sir. Sir, later you will give a goodwill message in the course of this. Thank you, sir. We also have the MD of uh, Corporate Minds Associate here present, Engineer Adejare Amo. You're welcome, sir. Pastor Michael Buluji is also here. Our former director, Cesar, is here. A BOR member from UNN is here in our midst, Professor Anyakule. Professor Anyakule, you're welcome, sir. We have Dr. Efosa Idemudia, uh, uh, one of our visiting lecturers from U.S. Please can you stand for recognition? You are welcome, sir. We also have Mr. Yemi Asade. They are from UK's Nigeria. UK's is United Kingdom Education Advice Service, and they are here present. You are welcome. And I know that they have a stand out there for our graduates to see what they have there. We also have Professor Jehu Akinyemi from FUNAB. Professor Akiyemi, you're welcome, sir. We have uh, Mr. Bamodosi Olaumi from ETL. You're welcome. We also have here uh, Professor Nana D. Graft from God's Power DE, and then the Godfrey Eboime from the same establishment. And then Mr. Dekunle Fakbe, thank you so much. Briefly, before we round off, we'd like to invite the rep of our executive secretary, NUC, to please come for a word. Thank you, sir. The chancellor and chairman of uh, Board of Regents Covenant University, the vice chancellor Covenant University, our distinguished convocation lecturer, please permit me to stand on uh, existing protocols. I bring you greetings from the Executive Secretary National Universities Commission, Professor Julius Okoje O.N., and uh, to convey his best wishes for a very successful 11th convocation lecture. Definitely, the convocation lecturer has uh, presented a thought-provoking lecture this uh, morning, and I believe that it should not just end with being thought-provoking, it, it should be an action-provoking lecture as well. We should uh, go beyond the issues he has presented to see how we can turn things around in our higher education sector in this country. And I'm glad to, to, to put a record that from his lecture, he has also alluded to the fact that we have the capacity to turn things around. And that is what we should do. Governments, universities, the, the, the regulatory agencies, and all stakeholders of higher education. And I believe we can do it. And I want to uh, 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 identify with the good work the Covenant University is doing in this area. I mean, since establishment, they have actually shown themselves to be worthy and are making the difference in the higher education sector in this country. And on this note, I want to congratulate you and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That is our regulatory body. Without NUC, you are not a university. Thank you. We like to also ask Engineer Demola Olorun Femi to please come for a word as well the immediate past president of NSC. The Chancellor, the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, the guest lecturer, let me adopt the protocols. I am highly honored to be here. I thought I was going to sit quietly and enjoy um, 
the lecture. I'm here as part of the CU family, and of course, the LM family, uh, Landmark. I'm a citizen of Landmark um, University. I'm a proud father of Adebuega, a lot of family. Adebuega, can you stand up? <laughs> so I, I, you can know that I'm part and parcel of this university. I want to thank the university fellows especially. I was here three times as president, and I knew that Covenant University and the number of the private universities are the way out. They are the one that will see us through these times. The guest lecturer said the obvious, the representative of the chancellor, you're obviously on the right path. Like she mentioned, we must be very visible. I have no doubt that the way the private secondary school did to Nigeria, um, Covenant, among other private universities, would help us out. I want to correlate the vice chancellor, and I want to ask you that you should continue the good works in terms of uh, patents. Uh, that's very essential. I want to thank you once again. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I like to also recognize the presence of the Vice Chancellor from uh, Littoral University, Republic of Bene. Here present, Professor Oyebode Ayeni. Sorry for that. Uh, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. At this point, we'd like to invite the Registrar to move a vote of thanks. The Registrar. The Chancellor, sir, has been represented by the Education Secretary, Professor Mrs. Bridget Shokun. Please aggrieve your indulgence, sir, to stand on the already established protocol. It is my great privilege this morning to bring the vote of thanks. And I want to start by giving glory to God who has made this day a possibility. God is the reason for the season. And looking back, all the achievements of the session, and talking about the graduating set, they have been here four, five years. Some fell by the way, but the Lord has kept these ones and has made this week a possibility for them. We give all the praise and all the glory to him. Also, we want to appreciate the Chancellor of Covenant University for creating the Covenant University platform. We want to appreciate God for his commitment and tenacity to the fulfillment of the vision. The scripture says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But we are vision made, we are kept by vision, and we are advancing by vision. We give glory to God for that. We want to deeply appreciate our convocation lecturer. We are inspired and motivated by your intellectually stimulating lecture. And for us, as a university, this will not only motivate us towards further expanding the frontiers of knowledge and scholarship, but also to ensure that putting to work and running with all that we have had today, that vision one of 10 in 10 becomes a reality. That is, by the year 2022, Covenant University shall be one of the best 10 universities in the world. And for faculty and staff and all of our well-wishers, we thank you for your goodwill. We thank you for sharing your precious time with us, being here to rejoice with us, to celebrate with us. And it's our prayer 
that you also will enter soonest into your season of celebration in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I will remember to recognize our former Vice Chancellor and now Vice Chancellor of Landmark University. Thank you for always being there. We appreciate you. And for the class of 2015, 2016, I say welcome to your season of release. Thank you. We also thank you, sir. As we close, the, immediately after this lecture or after this event, we are moving to the Kukrit building for the commissioning of that building. All of us are invited to be part of that. We like to also note that later by 2 p.m., the colleges will be having their hooding event, the hooding event at the colleges. And after the commissioning of the Kukri building, we'll be having an exhibition at the ALDC. The exhibition will be taking place at the ALDC. Then later in the evening tonight, by 6 p.m., we shall be having a special gospel concert and variety night. By 6 p.m., a special gospel concert and variety night. At this point, we'd like to invite the chaplain of Covenant University to please come and close us. Shall we rise for closing prayers? Father, we thank you again because you have proved again that you are a good God. We thank you for the success of this special convocation lecture. We thank you for the instrument you use in imparting knowledge. The guest lecturer, he has come to water. We want to ask that you water him again in the name of Jesus. Father, we worship you. We want to ask for the needed grace to translate what we have heard here into action in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless your name. We want to commit everyone that is part of this great lecture unto your able hands. As they go from here, let your presence not elude them in the name of Jesus. We want to commit the remaining activities of the day unto your able hands. Your cancer shall stand. Your name alone shall be glorified. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. So shall it be. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, please, we are going to be taking the CU anthem, but I'd like to remind us again, all our guests, all our faculty, all our staff, all our students, are please expected to be at the commissioning of the Kukri building immediately after this, the CU anthem. Thank you. We are exiting on the high table.